Uh, good morning um, for, for both of our panelists. Uh, good afternoon for me and good evening for a lot of people in China. This is the China weekly hangout um, today on with a focus on innovation. Um, uh, a welcome from the sunny hills of Lake Geneva. Um, we uh, we try to... Uh, my name is von Steinstra. As you can see from the bottom, I'm uh, uh, mostly running the China Speakers Bureau, and once a week we turn to uh, a China-related subject. And um, uh, my traditional start is also with an apology. This is emerging technology, so there's a fair chance we crash somewhere in the middle. And since since I cannot apologize after the crash, I do this in advance. <laughs> and Greg should not uh, laugh too much because we get some nasty disturbances here. Um, uh, first, an announcement for next week. Next week, we have a question on an, an, a, a China Weekly Hangout on, on Huawei. Uh, we, uh, there has been a lot to do, and the question, what Huawei did wrong, has not really been answered. So, what yeah. we are going to do is we are going to look back a bit on what happened in the US, and possibly also now in Canada, Australia, the UK, and the uh, a few other countries, and um, uh, at least David Wolf will be uh, from Beijing will be joining us. He he wrote an excellent book on on Huawei that has not been read by the uh, the, the panel the intelligence panel of the of the U.S. Congress. That's a, that's a, that's a pity. And and uh, Andrew uh, Andrew Hooper will be there, who is a specialist on. Uh, on negotiations, so that seems also very useful. Well, this week we're going to focus on innovation, and as you uh, might know if you're familiar with China, there are two big schools. There's one school who says that China is a copy-paste country where never uh, uh, any, any real innovation will come from, and others think that China is moving very fast and will very soon, uh, people in Silicon Valley might have to close their um, their, 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 their offices because they all have to move to China. Now we have two panelists here and we might get some more people in here. Greg Anderson is uh, joining us from, from California. For him it's, uh, it's very early. He's the author of this, this excellent book, Designated Drivers on the Automotive Industry in China. And what makes it actually the automotive industry in itself is 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 interesting, but uh, but uh, he also describes how it interferes with uh, the government. And that um, on the other side, on, uh, we have uh, Jeanette Komorski, This time with a good uh, a good internet connection and a um, clear microphone. And Jeanette Komorski is the uh, say uh, I call her my my China guru at large. We, 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 we can use her for almost any subject that, that we, uh, we do. Well, first, first a, a little round to, to the two of you, uh, Jeanette. Uh, which of the two schools are you in? Um, I'm in both. I, I, th oh. I think it depends on the sector and how we define innovation. I'm, I'm more in the copy-paste school because I think that what the Western world defines as innovation is a sort of behavior that is you know not really doesn't have deep roots in, in Chinese economic history or Chinese social history I, I do think the Chinese discover new things and I think that they're very forward-thinking and very progressive in numerous ways but what we define as innovation is, you know the, the, the kind of teamwork the collaboration the um, the individual ownership of a, of a vision and a strategy and a new idea is is not really what the Chinese do as far as I can see and having said that I, I think you know they, they come up with pretty uh, groundbreaking things at, at times in their history so I wouldn't rule them out completely but I, I would say more you know if we're going to use the Western perspective they're more copy paste. Okay well but that, that fits a little bit in one of the, the panelists I invited Bill Fisher he, uh, he did an, an, another he did a book uh, The Idea Hunter and, and, and his argument is also that, that uh, most of the uh, innovation is uh, copy-paste. And, and, and so we should not bother about that. Greg, what is your take on this? Um, yeah, I, I think like any China person, you have difficulty putting yourself in one camp or the other. I mean, if you're really thinking about it, because for every example you find that supports one side, you can think of another example that supports the other side. That is 
just simply the nature of, of studying China and uh, having experience in China. Um, there are always two sides and actually even more sides than that quite often. Um, so I, I don't really put myself on one side or the other. I see a lot of evidence for both. Um, until now, I, I do agree with Janet that until now, China has been largely it's sort of in the copy-paste camp. Um, I, when you asked me to, to join the, the broadcast here, I really started thinking really hard. What innovations has China come up with in recent years? Um, what sort of breakthrough, uh, groundbreaking innovations have, have emerged from China? And it, I still struggle to think of that. Um, and, you know, we can get into this more, um, certainly what I've found through my uh, research in the auto industry, but uh, uh, still it's largely in, in this particular industry, it's very much a catch-up industry. Um, and what makes it even more difficult, it's not simply a matter of just catching up and being caught up, it's a matter of staying caught up because the target that China is aiming for is also moving. Okay. Now, well, well, uh, yeah, well, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch myself, and we have this beautiful company called Philips that was especially uh, famous for doing all kind of groundbreaking uh, innovations they could not sell. Uh, that, that was their main problem. They, they, they could invent things, but they did not sell things. And one of the, the arguments is also um, that the China is, 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 is better in commercializing existing uh, innovations than coming up with it itself. And, what the question is whether 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 being close to the market and being able to uh, commercialize the uh, the uh, uh, your innovations is not more important than the innovations itself, uh, Jeanette. Um, I see that China. I'm going to kind of answer this side from a side a side approach, a lateral approach. Um, the Chinese, to me, are tremendously creative and extremely innovative in social organization and in economic innovation. They are phenomenally good at adopting new behaviors very, very quickly and at commercializing the adaptation of new behaviors very, very quickly. And I, I think, for example, of uh, the mobile gaming industry and, uh, you know, in, in Shanghai in 1990, maybe it was 1999 or 2000, um, the mobile gaming industry was relatively new, but within a year uh, in, in China, it was phenomenally common for people to have uh, mobile-based pets, like the Tamagotchi, and there was also mobile-based dating. People would come up with these mobile avatars, have them date, have them have children. <laughs> uh, they would have, you know, IQ quizzes and EQ quizzes, and it became an enormously uh, popular social phenomenon. So, you know, in the creation of a mobile gaming market, China was at least 10 to 12 years ahead of the US. I don't, you know, I don't even see people doing mobile gaming in the US here now and I, I suppose we have other virtual social platforms that are that are more suitable to us, you know, Facebook and uh, Instagram among them. Um, but, you know, in the development of the markets in general, the ability of the Chinese to kind of come together around an idea of what's hot and new and jump on it and create a market quickly is, um, you know, pretty pretty impressive to me. So they're, they're very, very quick to adapt socially, and I actually do think that in some ways that is more important because you can have geniuses and garages coming up with a, you know, solutions for something that stops the metastasis of cancer, for example, but if it never you know, gets out and commercialized and, and hospitals and doctors don't get behind it, it doesn't matter. So that, that's you know, my, short, my shortest possible answer to that question. <laughs> Greg, in the automotive industry, that, that's, that's not really a fast-moving uh, change there, is it? So, or am I mistaken? Um, well, you know, it's, uh, it's really surprising when you, when you start to dig into this. Um, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into the, the history of the industry, but remember back in the 70s, um, the Detroit automakers, which until that time had been on top of the world, um, basically ignored Japan. Um, and while the Japanese learned these advanced uh, uh, operational and managerial techniques that allowed them to very quickly catch up and improve quality, 
um, and to surpass the quality coming out of Detroit. And um, so it, it, that right there will show you sort of how <laughs> Americans tend to react to uh, foreign competition. Um, at first, they sort of ignore it. Um, and then only once it's caught up do they realize, oh, this is really something. Um, I, I think uh, in, in the meantime, the Americans, um, and certainly the Europeans as well, have realized that um, you can't simply rest on your laurels. Um, and so while, uh, while the Chinese now have come on the scene over the past 30 years in the auto industry, um, what, what has happened is Detroit has actually in the past oh, seven, eight years really woken up to the need for improved uh, fuel economy, um, driven largely by um, government mandates on, on uh, 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 miles per gallon. And so a lot of innovation has been coming out of Detroit really fast and furious. Uh, things like turbochargers um, have really been integrated in a lot of cars. Um, you're able to get a lot of uh, a lot more horsepower out of much smaller engines now, and uh, start-stop technology, regenerative braking, um, and plus ja uh, Japan has also um, certainly is is huge in this space as well. Yeah, but so, like, maybe we can go back a bit to also to uh, to China, like, like the innovations from Japan. They have uh, meanwhile conquered the handbooks of the business schools. That's 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 very well. What kind of uh, of innovation do you see coming from China? Um, I don't. Not in the auto space. Um, there, there's there's really there's none. Um, I mean, if you think about all the aspects of a of, of a vehicle that could uh, drive innovation, um, you've got basically what's under the hood, how the car moves, and then you've got uh, the outside, um, how it looks, and then you've got the interior, how it feels. And in all of these uh, different aspects, the Chinese have been largely still struggling to stay up with innovations that they see in uh, coming out of other markets. And uh, as I said before, the other markets continue to remain innovative in this space. I, I think probably the closest the Chinese have come has been um, on interiors. Um, they have been uh, very eager to to integrate uh, the uh, the infotainment systems and the, uh, the larger screens on the dash of the cars. Um, that has come along faster in China probably than anything else. And when you think about it, it's because it simply involves um, taking an operating system which is already there, Android, which is largely the the basis for most of these, um, and a screen which you can buy anywhere. They're they're made by the tons in uh, Shenzhen. So, um, so this has been the area where the Chinese, I think, probably have uh, closed the gap the most. Um, and in terms of, of ex exteriors, how the car looks on the outside, um, I have noticed a, a huge increase in the, uh, the talents of, of Chinese designers. Um, I went to the Shanghai Auto Show in 2009, and um, I just looking at the cars then, I noticed a lot of uh, just detail work that was really uh, sort of shoddy looking. And these are show cars. These are supposed to be the best of the best of the Chinese cars. And on the floor of the show, you know, you would see like a, a seam between, um, you know, between panels that maybe gradually gets larger toward the bottom. Um, just little, little things like this. Um, and the designs were largely generic back then. Fast forward to this past April when I was at the Beijing Auto Show. Um, I saw some really innovative designs. Um, placement of a crease on a door is not an easy thing. Um, and, you know, coming up with the engineering, the, uh, the, uh, the, the specs that make it happen, and then being able to have someone on the floor create that panel that looks that way. Um, a, companies in China have really moved the ball forward. Um, but at the same time, the new design elements I started seeing in the Chinese cars this time um, largely are copied from what has been coming in the foreign cars, the uh, American and European and Japanese cars o over the past few years. So it's still very much uh, an idea of catch up. Okay, well, well maybe we should in indeed uh, differentiate between between industries, but that looks a little bit like they, they are copy and copy pasting, but they do it in a very intelligent way, maybe more intelligent than the original designers have done it. Jeanette, oh yeah, of Greg, yeah. Um, 
you know, it's it's Greg's example um, of the crease in a door panel, but um, I can I can kind of riff on that uh, a little bit. Um, you know, I, I see so much of the debate about how China and the U.S. are different, how China slash slash Asia is different from the U.S. slash the West. Um, and, and culturally how that affects uh, things like industrial development and industrial design and, the, and economic organization. When, when I think about innovation in the Western sense, there's two components of it that the Chinese are really weak in, um, but you know they have recognized they're really weak in. So stay with me for a minute. Um, the first you know, aspect of the Western model of innovation is a sense of play that uh, we have a culture where there's relative institutional stability where people you know can get up in the morning uh, and, and dream a bit they don't have to sort of always be hustling and, and always be moving from crisis to crisis and worried and the educational system allows us uh, to be children for quite a long time and, and to play a lot so the dreaming of a dream the I think I can make something better I think I can do something and wouldn't that be fun you know culturally that that has that has a history of, of several generations um, and one of the reasons I would hold that America uh, is, is, you know, has innovated many things is, you know, that pioneer spirit where people came here and, and dreamt big dreams and had a sense that they could play and, and do something different. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one thing. The second thing that the West does very differently from China is a sense that the individual is the, is the critical unit of society. Uh, China is very, very much a group society. Nothing happens in China until, you know, everybody's on the bus and going in the same direction and the driver's got the key in the ignition and it is going forward. So, um, you know, the innovator in the West is this kind of hero. It's this one dude. It's, you know, Henry Ford. It's Bill Gates. It's Steve Jobs. It's Warren Buffett. It's like one person who's got Mark Zuckerberg, right, who's got the vision, the strategy, the execution. The Chinese tend to do everything in groups. So, you know, the heroism of building a better mousetrap is certainly not something that motivates the individual quite as deeply. I mean, there's a lot of big egos in China. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> so what, what I'm really saying is once the Chinese become more effective as a, as a collective society of acknowledging that the sense of play and the definition of heroism are critical to building people who move industrial development into the future, they will start changing their educational system and their culture in whatever ways they can to accommodate that. Um, and I think they've already started. But, I, but, I but, uh, Janet, your, your point is then that people like Jack Ma or, or Robin Lee, that they are uh, working, doing their job in a different way than Henry Ford did in the past. Um, perhaps they are, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm also the sort of person who's going to make an argument that Silicon Valley, and the, in, in particular, uh, Route 128 Boston, Silicon Valley, California, and Zhongguansun in, in Beijing are all sort of creatures uh, that were contributed to largely by the American policy of allowing Taiwanese engineers to come to the U.S. and study at Caltech and MIT and Stanford in the 70s and that you know Taiwanese slash ethnically Chinese capital and that classic traditional Chinese focus on basic research and mastery of you know the infrastructure of a system of chemical thought or physical thought or biological thought married to this American environment where there is individual heroism there is the culture of play there's a lot of stability I mean we have Taiwanese money all over Silicon Valley and a lot of what's happened with the internet sector in China is a second or third generation of ethnic Chinese ie super scientists married to a culture of let's create something fun and let's put capital behind it. And I, I would put Jack Ma in that category. I would put Jack Ma in the category of people who, you know, found a trust factor with the the Silicon Valley model and the Zhongguansun model and started to, you know, to, to think that way. Greg, Greg, would you see a kind of uh, Henri Ford in, in China? I'm sorry, say again? Uh, would, you, would you see an equivalent to Henri Ford in the automotive industry? Uh, they are not as, as as outspoken as the the internet guys are. Right. Well, 
Um, it's a little bit different. Well, in fact, it's a lot different in the auto industry um, in that the auto industry is very heavily state dominated. And uh, whereas the internet industry, um, you know, the state in China has made attempts to enter that industry and they've largely uh, not done very well. Um, the, the internet industry in China has been driven by private companies and by individuals, many of whom, like Jack Ma, uh, spent a significant time overseas and uh, learned how it felt to work in an environment that encouraged in innovation. Um, in the auto industry, it's, it's a bit different because this is one of China's pillar industries. Um, and most of the big manufacturing industries, what what uh, countries consider to be, you know, sort of heavy metal, uh, metal bashing stuff, um, tend to be state dominated. Um, the auto industry is certainly no exception. Um, among the top dozen companies or so, nine are state owned. Uh, the the largest uh, are uh, like Shanghai Auto, Dongfeng, uh, First Auto. These are uh, state owned enterprises that are considered the backbone of China's economy. Now there are private players in China. And these tend to be the ones that have the proper incentives um, and desire for innovation. Uh, little companies like Geely and uh, Great Wall and BYD. They think big. They have big ideas. Um, they, uh, the leaders themselves may not have worked abroad much, but they have they very early in their lives hired engineers, Chinese engineers who had worked for, say, um, you know, a, a Volkswagen or a Ford or GM and brought them in. So there's a, a there's a huge uh, desire for innovation among the private companies in China. Um, the unfortunate side of things is that the private companies have been largely marginalized in the auto industry and in other construction type industries, manufacturing type industries, because the state so heavily favors its own companies and because the leaders of these state-owned enterprises uh, tend to be more politician than business person. Um, they lack the sort of incentives you would want to see to drive innovation forward. Investment in innovation in, uh, in a manufacturing industry requires a lot of foresight. It requires a lot of long-term thinking. The investment to build a single car model is roughly a billion dollars, uh, give or take just to build a, mo a, a car model, a billion dollars. Well, you've got to be able to set that kind of cash aside. And you have to think long term. You have to start that money through the pipeline early. Oh, and, and not just this year, but next year and the year after and the year after. So we're talking, you know, 5, 10, 15 years out. The auto automakers are thinking that far ahead. But when your job depends on a political cycle that runs about five years from party Congress to party Congress, you don't think so much beyond five years because any investment you take now only helps the next guy. And so this tends to be the sort of environment in which the leaders of state-owned enterprises operate. And it's, uh, it's, it doesn't support innovation. Well, that brings us to this other division. Uh, we see it not only in the auto industry, but also in, in telecom and in other, where um, Everybody says that China is doing a great job in supporting this industry, but the state-owned companies seem to be more of a burden for the China's economy than an advantage. Uh, and, and the private companies seem to be more the, the, the companies that drive economic growth. What, what, how, how does that work, uh, Jeanette? Um. A yeah, big question. Um, you know, when I was listening to Greg talking uh, in terms uh, of his book, of course, and of, of the conversation about China so often, which places the involvement of Chinese government in industry in the category of a liability to China's future growth, um, a liability in terms of China moving up the productivity ladder, um, and you know, this the school of thinking that says, you know, private enterprise in China. Um, is so much more progressive and so much more powerful, but they're blocked from access to capital and markets because the government keeps all those things for themselves. And I was listening um, to you know him talking about that, and you know thinking you know really how do we divide the state-owned uh, enterprises and government-influenced um, 
businesses away from those who are trying to be independent and you know if they're independent in China are they in fact sort of in opposition to or in competition with the state and I think you know I think that's that's probably yeah they are um, it's, it's very hard to be a private uh, enterprise in China and to grow to any sort of scale um, I, I think you know I, I would have to say that I doubt that the the numerous think tanks, uh, the numerous economic planners, the numerous people at the development and reform commissions at the central government and provincial level levels in China, I would sincerely doubt that they do not know that the productivity of state-owned enterprises is lower than it should be. They know it. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, can they? Do they have the tools to affect a cultural change so that you know state-owned enterprises can somehow? reward you know individual efforts and uh, you know sort of conceptually led breakthroughs rather than uh, you know a 10 cents shaved off here and 10 cents shaved off there or some miracle of you know getting drunk with the right banker and getting the right interest rate for the next working capital loan which is kind of the way they work right now um, I, and I'd also kind of have to say that you know Huawei is a pri are we calling Huawei private? Just it's fairly, it's fairly private. Okay. That's what so they call themselves. Are, are we calling? Are we calling Hiar private? Um, that was this, this I, more. I think we call Hiar private, right. and yeah, I, I don't yeah. particularly yeah. see either of them as being massively innovative companies. I don't. I don't. You know, maybe maybe somebody will correct me, and hopefully, if I can join next week, I, I can talk to David Wolf. Um, um, and he'll tell me, you know, where Huawei has been innovative. But I, I'm not entirely sure that I see the private sector in China as being monumentally more productive or monumentally more innovative than the state-owned sector. Because I still feel that, you know, there's there's incentive issues and there's structural issues that hold back the state-owned companies from moving faster. But ultimately, I think the issue with innovation and productivity is cultural, and therefore it applies to the private as well as the public sector. What do you, I don't know, that's just me. Greg? Um, well, I'm a political scientist, so um, naturally I think the uh, problem is not cultural, but political. <laughs> 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 um, the, actually, I, I, I agree that there is something cultural there as well, but I, I think largely my, my findings are that the, the marginalization of the private sector isn't so much that uh, China's leaders hate the private sector. I, I think they like the private sector. They've said that they understand the innovation and the uh, the productivity that private the private sector does and can bring to China. Uh, you know, we've we've heard good words coming out of Beijing. I think the real sticking point, however, is political because there is a reason that state-owned enterprises dominate in China. That's because the state dominates in China, and that's. Uh, you know the 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 uh, the intention of the Communist Party to remain the unopposed uh, leader of China requires a very heavy hand in in the largest parts of the uh, of the economy. But There's can, a real can, can, can one question in between. Is yeah. it also because the political elite in China is very well connected to the state-owned companies and they are mainly working to. Uh, uh, also to, 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 to guard our own income. Well, exactly. And I think that's sort of, it's sort of a chicken and an egg issue there. Um, the party wants to remain in control. Individuals within the party and their families um, are um, the ones who benefit from the system as it exists. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of path dependence to be overcome. Um, there are a lot of vested interests um, who are very deeply entrenched that will fight any sort of reform. And so it's not, the, the idea of China becoming more innovative isn't, sim isn't a matter of simply saying, you know, we need to improve our environment for innovation. We need to have education from a very early, evil, from a very, uh, early age that encourages children to think critically and to think creatively and to play. Um, it's, it's more than that. It is um, creating the environment um, that you don't have people protecting their own personal nest eggs. Um, I mean, we see that in the United States as well. I mean, not, no country is immune from having vested interests resist a change to the system as it exists. Um, but I, I think the, the, big, the big difference in China is the insistence upon um, 
uh, lack of opposition to a single party rule is the major stumbling block that stands in the way of China becoming an innovation powerhouse. And I would go so far as to say the greatest ally that foreign automakers have in China, and not just automakers, but a, a lot of foreign companies, the greatest ally that they have right now is China's central government because the central government sitting on top of industry is actually preventing China's private sector from becoming the true innovators that I believe they have the potential to be. And that's that to me is the is the real key. So and then the internet has the uh, a mobile no not mobile but the internet has the uh, the fortune that it's not a key industry it's not a pillar industry. So then 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 the private companies get uh, get more chance. Well, and when you think about mobile, um, a lot of it is um, I think the the state tends to look upon it as sort of frivolous. Um, you know, people playing games on their phone, people um, you know people chatting or whatever, um, they, it doesn't result in a, a big tangible something that you can drop on your foot. And oh, I it think makes a lot of money for China Mobile and for which is oh, know, certainly. a state-owned company. Right, right. There's, there's, and this is a, that's actually I would say one of the areas in which China has been innovative and has led the world is this this one little space out here, um, mobile gaming, where the state has stayed out of it and has largely allowed them to do what they want to do. Um, they, you know, the ability to buy th um, things inside of an app, to buy a, a tool or a, a weapon or whatever, um, you know, with these micro payments, this, this sort of thing has been has come out of China, and uh, that's certainly an innovation. Is it helping to make life better for people? Well, yeah, I mean, it gives people something to do on the subway on the way to work. Um, but, oh, oh, come uh, on, but, Apple. But it, you know what, what, what's. You know the sense of play in personal computing is responsible for what seven percent of the of the of the of the Dow Jones Industrial Index right now. Apple. Well, I, I'm not a I'm not a a big gamer, so I I maybe in this regard I'm sort of uh, in line with uh, with China's leaders. I, I sort of see it as a bit frivolous myself, but. Um, but it, without question, it has been innovative. It has generated a lot of money. It has shown the potential of China's private sector to do what it can do when it's allowed to. Um, and just back back to the auto industry, I, part of the reason that the state-owned enterprises in China's auto industry have not um, really been able to move out and become innovative. I mean, they've got all the they've got the backing of the state. The, that's the deepest pockets you can find, um, and they have been. Um, hiring engineers out of Detroit, out of uh, Wolfsburg, Germany, um, you know, Chinese engineers that went abroad, got their bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhDs in engineering, 10, 20 years of experience, come back to China. But those people are not the ones who are being put in leadership positions in state-owned enterprises because they're not looked upon as those who really put in their time and, you know, grew up with uh, the the organization they can affect things but where the engineering comes from oddly enough is the fact that for 30 years state-owned enterprises in China have been directed into joint ventures with foreign automakers and it's the presence of those foreign automakers who bring over their own technology that have sort of addicted the Chinese automakers to having someone else hand them technology and why invest if someone's just going to give it to you, um, and of course the foreigners, um, you know, they they don't bring their very latest technology. Um, they may bring technology that's a few years old, a but few it's so much. <laughs> but it's it's so much easier to have someone else give you your technology than to invest the billions of dollars that it takes to to be innovative. And so there's there's that lack of incentive among the leaders of the state-owned enterprises. And then, in addition to that, there's the addiction to the foreign technology that's just essentially handed to them. It's phenomenally so, efficient, don't you think? Well, it's, it's a way to build, and, and we have to give the Chinese credit for this, if nothing else. It's a way to build an auto industry from scratch, to go from having none to having the world's largest auto market. And I think we have to give them credit for that. But when you compare them to the Japanese and the Koreans, these two small countries with with large economies um, invested but largely kept their auto industries in the private sector. And um, so 
when you look at uh, you know Toyota and Hyundai, these companies are actually um, known now as innovators. We may have laughed at them decades ago when they first entered the scene, but they are private driven. Um, and they sell cars all over the world. They export cars all over the world. This is something that China has been trying for 30 years to do. But the connection with the foreign automakers has merely addicted China's uh, state-owned enterprises to that foreign technology. Well, let, let's, let's uh, tie and pull it back to the innovation again. Um, well, we cannot uh, ask China to change its political system. We can actually maybe even not ask the politicians to leave the state-owned companies and let them do their work. Um, what is the best way for Chinese companies or for China as a country to become more innovative? Develop a banking sector that's capable of calibrating risk. Well, that's another another state sector we haven't discussed yet. The banking sector. That it's is the only course. one that really matters because as long as the as long as the lending to industry is directed by five year plan and the four big state owned banks, then the banks are a tool of government industrial policy, and we have a banking sector that is completely unable to allocate capital based on deep knowledge of a sector and a technology and its likelihood of succeeding. So we have bankers in China who are far too passive to be effective in allocating capital. And I, I don't know that that's really, you know, Greg, you're the political scientist, so you can tell me whether, you know, uh, it, it, what, what, where state control of banks uh, comes into all of this. Because, you know, again, we're going back to mobile or the internet sector in general, which have largely been financed by venture capital from the West. Um, so what's, you know, and, and those venture capitalists from the West, I'm going to point it out again, happen to be largely colleagues with, if not themselves, ethnically Chinese, having had some experience in, in the West. So what, when, when does that happen in, in, in China, and uh, what, what does the political system have to do with it? Um, well, I, I think for the same reason that the state dominates the, the big industries in China, um, finance is really important. Being able to direct where money goes is a key political lever in any society. And uh, we have, we can look right here in the United States to see how that works. Um, uh, you know, you can, well, I don't want to get into U.S. politics. I was about to talk about Citizens <laughs> United, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll let that go. Um, but yeah, I mean, having control over the levers of finance is a real key to controlling an economy and to getting what you want. And uh, so this is still, it's, it's state dominated. There are a few private banks in China. Um, but for the most part, the, the capital comes out of the big four. And uh, your average Chinese banker, you know, a, a, a lending officer who goes to work, it's, it's very similar to the auto industry in that, you know, you've got, you can do it, you can do things the hard way by investing um, in the auto industry. You can invest, you can have a long-term plan, and you can take a gamble because it is a gamble. It's a risk. You can take that risk, and uh, if it pays off, you do very well, you get rich. Um, or you can take the easy road, which is to use the foreign technology. Bringing that to the banking sector, you've, all, you've also got that sort of dichotomy of choices. You can take the easy road, which is every time an SOE walks in the door and wants to borrow money, you lend it to them. If they don't pay it back, no big deal. They're part of the family. Um, you just roll that loan over every year and you don't get in trouble. But if you take the risk and you lend to a private company and they don't pay the money back, your job is on the line. And that's, bankers can do that and sometimes they do do that. But for the most part, it's easier just to take, to, to, to pick the low hanging fruit, which are the SOEs. You can't get in trouble for lending to an SOE in China. It's interesting to look at Zhejiang province and how Zhejiang has, you know, for a very long time had the largest percentage of private enterprise um, of any mm. province in China. And, you know, what happened when money supply got tight and when credit, you know, dried up uh, late last year and earlier this year was, you know, the whole province of Zhejiang was, was suffering mm. because, you know, they weren't state-owned enterprises. And I, I haven't checked in on that situation lately. Um, I, I know who to call and ask about it, but you know I'm also sort of watching the 18th Party Congress, uh, which is coming in a, in a couple of weeks, and 
I really want to see, you know, who's who who are going to be the seven to nine men who are going to rule China and, and, and where they stand on the whole experiment of private enterprise and financial reform and, you know, who's got a voice about Zhejiang province. Maybe nobody. Who knows? But, you know, that's what I'm looking at. Well, Zhejiang has, has not been uh, really an innovative province. I've been traveling there quite a lot and what you would see was... Uh, pretty low-end stuff. It, it, it was not really, uh, in terms of innovation, a kind of uh, example. You, you could get your shoes there and your and your lighters and your ball pants and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, they, they knew how to make money and they had an original way of uh, going uh, uh, around the, uh, the state-owned lending system. But it was not really innovative. Right, and the short, you know, and I, I actually did some work in Zhejiang in uh, the, you know, earlier this decade uh, with some friends of mine from the Ministry of Science and Technology um, and their, their incubator program, and they had identified a number of Zhejiang based enterprises that had what they assured me, you know, was extremely important, um, efficient building technology. And they went looking for loans from the same lending sources that Judge Young Private Enterprise used, namely other private capital underground banks. And you know the dichotomy between the private banks that are lending to this sort of small, you know, not very innovative business in Judge Young and looking for really short-term returns in a business they can really understand. And on the other hand, the state-owned banks that are just being directed by policy to lend huge amounts of money to very heavy pillar industries. I mean, there's just nothing in between. So back to the point that, you know, Judge Young, yeah, there we have private enterprise, but it's not scaling and it's not innovative because it doesn't have the capital structure that's appropriate for innovation. So, well, well, I did desperately try to get you back to innovation, but obviously the, uh, the political system... We just system. want to talk about capital and innovation. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's, that's, that's fine, and probably, probably that's, that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's in the end is, 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 is the underlying factor that's, that's uh, determining also the innovative uh, capacity of a country. Um, I think Greg and I are both saying that the Chinese can be great innovators. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we, we, we're nearing the end, uh, Greg, Janet. Um, any, anything, um, any uh, smart advices you have to give to uh, the Chinese government or uh, innovators around, uh, uh, Greg? Um, well, I, you know, I, I agree with Janet. I think we're largely sitting here waiting to see what the next administration does in China. Um, Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji in the late 90s um, we're moving China in a direction that by all appearances was intended to make China into a more innovative place. Um, there was heavy privatization that went on. Over 40 million people in state-owned enterprises lost their jobs in the late 90s. And what's fascinating is as those state-owned enterprises in the late 90s were shut down or privatized or whatever, you saw the curve <laughs> As people in state-owned enterprises lost their jobs, people in private enterprises moved right in and and completely replaced those jobs. So you had a, a huge happens gradually in China. It always does. Um, he had laid the foundation for those reforms to come into, into being, and they were continuing apace even after the new um, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao administration came in in 2002. 2005 was the year that all of that sort of stopped. The key people that had been put in place in the financial sector in China um, began to be marginalized, not necessarily demoted or fired or anything, but just moved out of positions in which they were able to implement Zhu Rongji's uh, ideal reforms. 
that began under who and one and has continued and then the reaction of the Chinese government to the global financial crisis further compounded that. It further scared them and it, it further drove them to entrench the state in the economy rather than to uh, privatize. So, so you had these, you had already a, a desire under the who and one administration to, to sort of stop some of the, uh, the financial reforms that had been put in place. And then you had this global financial crisis that came along and scared them even more. And so you've got, you've had basically this whole administration has been focused on entrenching the state. And now there is a chance to essentially wipe the slate clean and start again. But I remember in 2002, people were saying, well, Hu Jintao, he could be the next big reformer in China, you know, yeah. and, and, and what a, what a surprise uh, that turned out to be that we were all wrong. <laughs> well, well, um, so it, maybe, it, it maybe Xi Jinping is the next guy. Yeah, well, it was neatly uh, summarized in uh, getting into a harmonious society. So, Je Jeanette, do you think the next uh, uh, government will be less ha less harmonious, more like, say, Zhurong Chi style, or <laughs> do you have any expectations? Um, I'm not sure, but I'm going to try to talk about innovation. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a shot. Give it a shot, yeah. Really short. Um, if I were the queen... Uh, if I had the power to do this in China, I would start a Xerox Park like project, mm -hmm. and I would, you know, study the organizational structure, capacity, and functioning of a very successful Western venture capital organization, and I would build one um, within the Ministry of Science and Technology's incubator system, and I would keep the princelings out of it. I would make a large amount of capital and a large amount of autonomy available to people who really had, you know, in a group, deep engineering expertise, deep social and marketing expertise, and deep financial expertise, and could work together as a group to pick some of the winners who are, who are emerging in China right now and who just can't connect with state capital or the private sector and we will start to see for real you know can the Chinese innovate uh, and commercialize innovation or not right now you know the financial structure blocks it and the political structure Greg to your point okay well, well thanks very much uh, Jeanette Komorski from New York uh, Greg Anderson uh, our specialist on both the government, the political science, and and the auto, the auto industry. I think it was a nice summary of, uh, and 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 uh, well, one of the things we have to do, but we will probably do this uh, in uh, November, is uh, get into the political system as the the new puppets come into place, and and, and see if you can make some sense out of it. Um, well, I'm going to make sure I have a two-year multi-entry visa before I join. <laughs> Yeah, that, well, if they still uh, if they still do these things, uh, 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 well, to close no, up, don't actually. It's only one year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was afraid so. It, it, I, 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 that's a different uh, uh, problem. I, I hear a lot of people who are getting some uh, problems with their visa, but that might be the uh, upcoming party uh, conference. That, um, well, I just want to close off with uh, uh, repeating that next week we will uh, focus on Huawei, what they did wrong and how they can survive in a global market, if, if, if at all, with uh, David Wolf and maybe Jeanette too. And uh, but thank you, Greg and Jeanette. I think it was uh, uh, very, very, very uh, uh, good to have you here. And uh, I hope um, the people who viewed it uh, uh, also thought so. Oh, I enjoyed it. Exactly.